All right, good evening, everybody. I'd like to call a special meeting of the city council to order. City clerk, roll call, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, before I call roll call, I just want to announce that Council Member Sarno will be joining us today via Zoom. Mm -hmm. Council Member Sarno? Here. Council Member Trujillo? Council Member Zamora? Here. Mayor Pochum Rodriguez? And Mayor Mora? Here. Thank you. Okay, public comments are now open. City clerk, do we have any members of the public uh, present wishing to speak today? Mr. Mayor, at this moment, we don't have any public comments. Okay, we'll now close public comments. All right, to business agenda item number four, Senate Bill 1383, Organic Waste Recycling. I'd like to call our Municipal Affairs Manager, Mayor Bill Garcia. Good evening, Mayor and Honorable Council Members. Um, this evening, we will be talking about State Senate Bill 1383. And let me tell you, this is the most significant uh, waste reduction mandate the state of California has adopted in the last 30 years. Um, it requires the state to reduce organic waste by 75% by 2025, which equates to over 20 million tons annually. The law also requires the state to increase edible food recovery by 20%. As of today, no other government in the world has created SB 1383's legal mandate to recover edible food, which is sent to landfills to give people a need. According to the California Association of Food Banks, one in eight or 4.6 million Californias are food insecure, including one in five children. At the same time, more than 5.5 million tons of food waste are disposed in California landfills each year, according to CalRecycle. So we are very wasteful. So this is very impactful. What we are doing today is setting up for the future. And with that, education is, is key to this. To accomplish this, local governments, food generators, and food recovery groups need to achieve this 20% food recovery goal. We need to do the following. One, commercial edible food generators must recover for human consumption the maximum amount of their edible food that they would otherwise dispose of in landfills by making written agreements with food recovery organizations or services to accept this food instead of us dis disposing it. Local governments must consult with food recovery organizations and services to implement edible food recovery programs and ensure adequate capacity exists to recover that food which we have that in place. Food recovery groups must follow rules for record keeping and reporting. This is gonna be very essential. And there will be uh, educational material that will be out um, to make sure we comply with that. And now they've structured this into, sorry, let's see, into there's a two tier implementation process. So tier one, which is coming upon us fairly quickly, which is January 1, 2022. Those are food generators, which include supermarkets and large grocery stores, food service providers, food distributors, and wholesale food vendors. Tier two are um, large restaurants, hotels with on-site food facility and 200 or more rooms, health facilities with an on-site food facility and 100 or more beds, large venues and large events, state agencies with large cafeterias and local education agencies with on-site food facilities. For this, we have until January 1, 2024 to comply. There's obviously legal requirements that are in place for this. This 1383 stipulates how waste generators and local governments must operate to keep organic material out of landfills. And these requirements include um, some of the stuff is just have residential organics collection service for green waste. And many of us are in the process of adding food waste collection services. Oftentimes this stuff is commingled in one of our trash cans, but we're gonna have to be very mindful and learn how to separate this stuff. And all organic waste generators, both residents and businesses, as well as non-local entities and local education agencies are required to participate in organic material collection program. So basically it's all of us, all of us in the nation are gonna have to do this. 
So all jurisdictions must adopt um, enforceable ordinances, which ours is in place, um, to ensure that all residential and commercial generators are compliant. And this has to be done by 2022. So what happens if we don't act? We will, um, if we fail to act on this, um, it's going to result in us being non-compliant and there sub we could be subject um, to fines of up to $10,000 per day. While the state is suggesting that 2022 and 2023 will be non-adversarial years where the state will only provide guidance and technical assistance, the regulations do not preclude fines during this grace period. So that's good to know. So we'll have a little bit of time, but that doesn't mean we have to wait to begin our program to then we, we are um, ready to go um, January, 2022. So in order, in order to do this, um, reducing organic waste will take a unified effort by local governments, businesses, and California residents by diverting organic material from landfills it will help reduce the dangerous impact climate change has on our weather, forest, homes, and ocean. At the same time, we'll use that material to feed people in need power our vehicles and improve soil for agriculture. And with that, I do wanna add that currently um, all the cities in LA County, which are 88 LA, LA cities, we meet on a monthly basis via Zoom and um, the county's Department of Public Works put this together. So we all work hand in hand because we're all in this together and we're all affected and we just wanna be in compliance and of good faith. So um, with that, now I wanna introduce and invite up Stephen Howe with Muni Environmental. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and City Council folks. I appreciate your time be able to come here and talk to you about this. Um, as Maribel already said, SB 30, 1383 has been passed by the state legislature. It is something that all jurisdictions and jurisdiction doesn't just include cities, it includes county agencies, all the schools and school districts, um, anybody who generates material, organic material, everyone is subject to this legislation. So as she mentioned also, there's 26, 27 million tons of organics currently gets deposited in, in landfills as we speak each year. Oh, there we go. And she also mentioned that food insecurity is one of the top things that the state of California is really looking at. What they want is to find a way to take as much material that is considered edible food and transfer that, give that to food banks, food organizations, food finders, um, Hearts of Compassion, whoever it might be. Those organizations will collect that, take that out, and distribute that that same day or the day after to shelters and places that need the food. That's something the state is really looking for, is because this is is a it's something they really want to see. They want to see us do food recovery, even though it's not mandated to do it until 2024, they're not gonna look at it directly until then. The further you head are on food recovery and it also saves a lot of money on trash. You can recover the food. You're, those organizations, those businesses are saving money on their trash disposal. So these are the key implementation dates, what we have to do. So we're already past the original rulemaking process. Um, they started the rulemaking actually in 2016, began the process of adopting it. And then now we're at the point where the red is in 2022, this starts taking effect. So having the ordinance, having the haulers in place, creating a program where you can collect residential food waste along with the green waste. And then in commercial, a lot of the commercial in Santa, in Santa Fe Springs already has, not a lot, a significant amount of the commercial in Santa Fe Springs does have organics collection already those generators. As we know, with the, with the um, large stores, just like Maribel said in tier one, 
Many of those stores already have food recovery. They donate the food already to organizations. We just have to be able to track that. They will have to sign an agreement. That's part of this with that food recovery organization they're sending it to. Uh, when they do that, we will get those figures of what they're diverting. So that is the big thing. That's one of the things that we have to track what's going in and out. And food recovery is going to be, it won't be a huge thing, but it'll be it's such a visual thing and it makes such a huge impact. It's something the state really wants to see us do. So the things that we have to do is provide organic collection for residential and commercial. As I said, residential in the city will most likely be combined with green waste. If you wanted to add a fourth cart for just organics itself, most homes don't generate enough to do a 35 gallon cart or, a, or a, especially a 60 or 90 gallon cart. They don't generate that much. So it makes it easier, although it is more costly to combine it with green waste because it has to be separated out when it goes to a facility. But adding a separate cart is going to be it's something you can look at and do but it's not really cost effective um, we have to conduct outreach and education to all the businesses and all the residents realistically it takes about three months to be able to get all that out there to get that in the hands of everybody they're already uh, putting it out on social media that these things are coming up so it's already being out there it's already in the process but we also have to create handouts we have to create and the haulers are going to be doing this too creating the educational component that goes with getting everybody knowing they have to do this the commercial side kind of already understands it but it's it's raising the bar 1826 was the other legislation previously that said commercial had to recycle their organic matter that be that was the process of beginning the point beginning it 1383 said <laughs> It's not just this little bit anymore, guys. It's way up here. This is the level now. So, but they've already, we've already got the carts out there. We've already got, many of the businesses already have organics collection. So we're ahead in, not everywhere, but we're ahead of the game in that. We have to let them know that the increase is going to be dramatic. And it's going to include a lot of places that normally you wouldn't consider. So this is the jurisdiction's responsibility. City's responsibilities are to provide the, we have to provide the organics collection for residential and commercial. We have to conduct outreach. We have to provide the opportunity for recoverable food. We have to uh, establish a food edible recovery program. We have to monitor it. The other part, which is up there, what you see is procure recyclable or recovered organic products. That's part of the state mandate now. So according to the amount of people in the city, they give us a target. You can either procure it in RGN, renewable natural gas. There's only a few facilities realistically that actually do that in the state now. It's limited. Or you can procure or utilize compost and give that away to residents or their homes or whatever you wanna do with the compost or on site in city facilities, wherever it is. They already have the, the report of how much each jurisdiction has to take. I believe it's 10,000 tons a year. You know, I have to go back and look at it, but um, per jurisdiction, everyone according to the size of the city has to procure that material. That's not going to be something they're going to look at right away. It's not something Cal Recycles is going to jump on right away. But 2024, they're going to look at that mechanism and say, how much are you buying? Are you are you meeting that mandate? Are you meeting that the the amount that your jurisdiction has been given? So this was what we were talking about the, the three cart service, two cart service, or one cart service. There are some jurisdictions that do have single stream. They're going to what's considered going to be considered a high diversion facility. The state has not mandated anybody for five diversion facilities yet. They haven't said this facility is high diversion. They're going to have to come up with their criteria and begin the process. So even though they're mandated that it has to be processed, they don't have the facilities to do it yet. 
So a lot of it's gonna to have to end up going to composting facilities first until there are high diversion facilities. So we're most likely choosing the three cart system because that's what we have in place. In the green cart, we'll be putting the food waste into it for residential. Commercial is already separated. They have their own carts or bins, depends on how much they generate. This is the food recovery organization that says this we have to do. You're working with the health department. Um, you're, you're actually, our, our main thing is to monitor and get the reports from the generators and the food recovery organizations to get them to give us the reporting needed to be able to monitor these programs. It will increase with time too. The more people know about food recovery organizations, we've already had the conversations with them. Uh, food finders wants to come in. There's already organizations and church organizations here that already collect. Those are ones we just need to get the information from them and have the reporting from them. That's all we, we don't want to make it complicated. Just how many tons a year you're taking or how every six months, how much are you bringing in? We don't want to complicate it, but we need to get the reporting for them. Education, again, same thing, electronic education. We have to have materials that go out to them stuff at City Hall also at the same time. So if someone comes in, they have access to all those uh, educational materials they need. This is the requirement we were talking about just a moment ago of procurement. So these are the one we've all, we're already doing. We already have a paper project or a paper recovery and recyclability within the city. So the city purchases a recycled material, recycled paper products, that all gets, that's already taken care of. The only part we have to worry about in time is are we going to use compost? Is that what we're going to procure? Are we going to use, maybe the haulers will be able to put renewable natural gas in their trucks. It's a conversion. It's going to cost them money, but that's a possibility they can do. If they do that, you'll meet that mandate in no time at all. But so we have options for the mandate. Electricity. The majority of jurisdictions are not going to buy RGN that's going to create electricity within their homes. It's not feasible. There's no facilities that can actually do it. So things we really have to focus on is ordinance, compliance and monitoring, and then enforcement. If, if in 2024, and they're given leeway, CalRecycle is very good. The city has a good relationship with CalRecycle already. Uh, the people who represent CalRecycle locally are really, really good and thoughtful, and their whole point is to assist. They won't really start enforcement and say that, that we're going to look at you and say you're not doing all that you need to do until realistically 2024. We also have to have in the ordinance an enforcement mechanism and someone says, yeah, I'm not going to do that. We're not going to do, we're not going to comply with that. We have to have an enforcement and fining mechanism in the ordinance that says, yeah, you have to do it or you're going to get fined. So there's a few things that have to be updated. It's very minimal, but it's something that has to be put in. There's the inspection and compliance enforcement. Um, that's going to be one of the costs that you're going to see when we're talking about rates is the haulers are going to have to take this material to a certain location because only certain places can recycle commingled green waste and food waste. They're gonna to have to monitor their business and do annual reviews on the businesses and see what they do. That's a, that's a new cost to them also. Um, we already know we're gonna use a three cart system. So for their reviews each year, you have to go by what, how many containers you're using. Then there's a review process for those containers. Three card systems, the simplest one. We do have to, at some point, if there's somebody who is a food generator and doesn't want to donate their food, their edible food, then there actually is a fining mechanism for that too. Um, I think we're going to see in the city itself, there's not a lot of second tier generators and the large generators here for food for food recoverable, the supermarkets are already doing food recovery. They're donating that. We just need to track it. That's all we need. We need to track and find out how much it is. 
they're already doing it. The Ralph's, the Food for Less, all those ones are already doing that. It's just tracking it. Tier two, we're dropping down, and that, as Maribel said, was uh, I think it's a hundred beds in a in a in a um, um, nursing home or a, a assisted living facility. It's uh, if it's a uh, uh, 500 rooms, I think it is for a hotel, um, then they'll have to comply with that also. Many hotels actually already have food recovery organizations helping them too. We just have to monitor it. We have to get the form that they need to fill out and send in every six months to the city. But <clears throat> that's what record keeping is. We have to find all those different things there are going to be a lot of uh, businesses in the city that are going to be exempt. They don't generate 20 gallons of organics. Um, they're just strictly a manufacturing facility, um, building aircraft parts or whatever it might be. All they have is their lunch stuff that people bring, and most of them take it home with them. There will be a lot of exemptions for those businesses. They don't have to meet that because they don't generate that 20 gallons of of organics per week. So we already meet the recycled uh, paper procurement pro project. That's already done. Um, the other thing is all these things have to have record keeping, and that is the responsibility of the jurisdiction, every jurisdiction, no matter how big. And we said there's the waivers. The, the, the waivers they're talking about here is, have nothing to do with us. We're not low population or rural areas. That's the state waivers. Um, they will oversee and monitor each jurisdiction. We do an electronic annual report to the state of California every August uh, for the previous year. We also do what's called MORE and MCR, which is uh, mandatory organics recycling and mandatory commercial recycling. Um, we do that every March, and then the state reviews what's submitted to them. And then if there's anything that doesn't meet those, uh, the criteria, they just, they give you time. They say, let's work on this. If this doesn't meet it, we'll work on it and find out what it is. Uh, we just received a letter saying that the EAR was accepted by the state and it, it, was, pro it was given to them in, in August. Everything is August 1st there. It takes them months to process their stuff, but they just sent a note saying you were accepted. That was an email that just came. So we know that the EAR was accepted this last year. So here we go. Rates, why is it gonna go up? And it will go up. Every jurisdiction is increasing their rates. They don't have a choice. One is the collection of organic, of residential. When you're collecting it and you're mixing green waste and food waste, what it requires is a separate facility. Green waste itself can go to a lot of different facilities for composting. In the city of Long Beach, they burn it all. Um, that's what surf is. Um, and they, we have no, I live in Long Beach. We don't even have a green waste bin to collect green waste in. They throw it in the trash can because they burn it all. So, <laughs> um, which they're going to get caught on, believe me. It'll, it'll come down. They'll be hammered to be able to do everything there. But that's where our big expense is, having to find the facilities that can take both green waste and food waste together. They're out there. Two of our haulers have processing facilities already that can do that. Um, the other one, he's very compliant. He understands. He takes it to places it has to be taken to. He knows what he's doing. So the other one is facilities that are accepted, just like we said. The number of facilities, the state, The state likes to say that, that the mandate, there, there's plenty of facilities out there, but if you look at it, yeah, there's not a lot of facilities out there. And they have a lot of work to do to improve and, and put the funding behind creating new facilities. Um, the state basically put this in as a mechanism that was kind of like an unfunded mandate. They didn't think out the process of what the infrastructure needed to be to be able to process all this organics. But it's on us to find where it can be taken and to take the associated cost until new facilities can be built. 
take the associated cost with the transportation, wherever it may be. We don't have a long transportation here. We have a pretty good rate. Uh, uh, things don't have to go too far. So if it was source separated, like the commercial, commercial food waste is source separated, it's clean material. It can go directly to either a compost facility, aerobic digestion facility, one of the other facilities that processes that material, even the sewer treatment plant in Carson, where they have a big tank and they put the slurried food into it, it kind of gestates in there and then they pump it directly into the sewage lines and they create RG and net renewable natural gas. And now it's pumped into the gas lines. So it's directly into Southern California Gas Company's gas lines. Now poop and food waste are being pumped in there as natural gas. So the other one that's going to, it doesn't increase the cost very much. It's very minimal, but the outreach and education for residential and commercial accounts, it doesn't increase their costs very much realistically. The other ones do more. And then the annual reviews and the and compliance and the contamination monitoring. The state wants to know if there's a lot of contamination, how do we stop that contamination? How do we get a more clean material? Uh, if you're putting food waste on top of recyclable materials, it lowers the amount, the, 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 the money they're gonna get back for their recycled materials, that contamination lowers that rate. So that's gonna be a big part for them. I think it's gonna cost them thousands a year to be able to meet that monitoring requirement, but they have to meet it. It's not a choice, it has to be met. Then they have to annually now go out and do site visits at all their commercial accounts to make sure that they're applying, they're, they're complying with the organics recycling, that they're also complying with the, the mandatory commercial recycling for recyclable materials. The less accounts they have who are participating in organics, the cost goes up because they, they're going to fill up a six or eight ton truck. If they're only filling up with one ton of food waste and they're hauling that X amount of miles, and that's all that's in that truck, the cost goes up. If they're hauling a full load, six or eight tons, there's that many more people who are involved in the process of, of recycling organic material, then their costs go down. They can spread it out over a lot bigger period of a lot more people. Then the Commercial Edible Food Recovery Organization, in the state mandate, it actually says that the cities and i.e. the haulers should be able to provide the necessary increase in, in um, capacity that food recovery organizations have to have. So they need refrigeration, they need refrigerated trucks, they need the ability to move that product from one place where they're, they're housing it at to the shelters and places like that. So they need refrigerated vehicles. There are grants with the state of California for that, but they're very limited. And with this much of an increase of what they're expecting, they're gonna have to do more. But they're putting the auspice on the cities to be able to create some sort of funding mechanism to help with recoverable food. It's not a priority, it's not something first, but it's something we have to consider. Um, first, of course, is to be able to get the commercial and residential organics in place. Then the food recovery is one of the priorities after that. But we already know many of our places already recover food. We just get the reporting from them. That's it for me. I'm willing to take any questions you have. Um, if you'd rather do it here, whatever you want to do, I'm, I can answer them. Um, Mr. Hell, if you don't mind, sure. um, maybe you can help everybody else and talk about how much experience you have in this field. Because technically speaking, he didn't work for Muni. Um, he, you work, well, go ahead and. Uh, I've been with Muni for two years. I've been doing this for since 1990, mm -hmm. since AB 939 came out. So uh, with a lot of different organizations, with a lot of different jurisdictions too. Um, especially with food recovery, food waste, and organics, that really has not been a priority. So 1826 brought that in really in 2016, 2017, it started really happening. So that was kind of my specialty where I kind of, um, 
they go to every single Cal Recycle meeting and all the organics committee meetings and all that stuff. And I, I watch what they're doing. I know many of the folks who are involved in it. So I've been around, I've been around the block, yes. So. Yeah, it just it makes it easier for the audience that are oh, yeah. you know, that's watching and even everyone here that you know he specializes in, in this and actually even Muni Environmental, you know, saw that ability and actually brought him on because he was doing it on his own and you know, or for different companies. So when he jumped on, it actually made it, you know, it made us stronger knowing that our consultant actually brought in somebody who who has the specialty. And of course, people don't realize having that um, that relationship with Cal Recycle, um, we earned that respect because in the beginning, when we first started off on them, and I see you shaking your head because, yeah. you know, um, we were actually, and a lot of things we were doing, we were, you know, out of compliance. We were literally out of compliance. And what people don't realize that when it comes to compliance, you know, when you try to fix it, remember, it's $10,000 a day. And to fix it, you're probably gonna take anywhere from six to eight months to actually fix. So do the math at six, six to eight months at $10,000 a day. That can literally break a city. So I know years back, four or five years ago, I know I had brought up an anaerobic digester. We had a great meeting because uh, it was German engineering because we mm -hmm. know that they do it Canada, you know, all across Europe. So that was something that we were, you know, that I was looking into. I think at the time, the, the vision for, um, you know, for certain individuals, they didn't have that at that, in, you know, at that time. So that's something we can look at too, as building an anaerobic digester where we have the place location, we can build it, even work with somebody else. And not only that, that's a means for us to make money. You know, there's like probably when you do that, there's four different means of making money because it's clean air and clean energy. And not only that, our vehicles in the future are probably going to be using that. So we have to have that foresight to understand that this is the future, you know, and it's not about the politics. It's not about things like that, because we know that um, what is it or Newport Beach has already put it in place two years ago, three years ago. They're already that far ahead of the program. So it's something that we need to make sure that we have the proper people in place, that we can do this. We are doing our thing, but sometimes we get certain individuals that come in our ear and say, oh no, I could do this, I could do this. Well, technically speaking, we could probably even look at, well, why not do it with us? Now we can make that extra money that we can use throughout our community, You know, certain other programs. It makes it a lot easier because of course with the landfills, they're not taking that because before it used to be shipped in containers across to Asia. Of course, we all see out in the port of Long Beach, you see all these, you know, you see that long line, you know, of ships, you know, so it's, it's not happening anymore. They were even looking into India, they were looking into other countries to actually take our trash, but now they're figuring out there's other means that it's not gonna happen. There's even things that they're- Right, there's actually a, a, an international a compact that's been signed that 180 countries said, yeah, we're not taking anybody's waste. Yeah. And then there's, they're even looking at even our trash bags. They're even looking into, um, there's a, they're actually in the process of it where they can get your trash bags recycled or your plastics, not your trash bags, I'm sorry, your plastics, recycle it and turn it into fuel. Mm -hmm. Of course, we never thought that could happen, but there are means that are out there that we could actually reach. But even like I said, if we look into something that I know four or five years ago, you know, certain individuals weren't ready to look at it, but we can look at it now and say, okay, you know, this is something we can do. Sometimes you can, you know, then what you can do, you can get a, one of the haulers or one of the different, you know, that they, they want to go in with you, but we have to make sure whoever we choose is actually, you know, abiding by all the rules. Because if we choose a haul or we choose one of them that are not looking at the diversion rate, the diversion rate is what we have to mandate. We have to look at the 75%. Eventually we have to hit 75%. If we don't, that's when you're gonna see the fines of $10,000. But we, because we have so many, you know, we have three different trash haulers. We have, you know, so many different types of recycling. Well, who's gonna take and say, well, it's not my fault. 
So there's loopholes for them to get out of that, but we have to pay it now. So there's other things and other restrictions that we have to get stricter with our rules. And it's not because it's to protect us, it's to protect our residents. You know, so, you know, this is something that I'm glad that they brought it forward. I'm glad, you know, thank you, Maribel. You know, thank, thank you, Mr. Howell. You know, tell Jeff, thank you for all the hard work that you guys put in. But this is, I mean, this is, we have to have that foresight in the future. And it's actually pretty cool what they do with a lot of this energy. You know, we can create our own little stations. You know, there's so many different things that we can do. Compost, we can look at it to go to the, um, to the garden, you know, look at, you know, putting it there with all the little lots that we have there. And, you know, there's so many different attributes that we can have our kids getting involved and it makes it easier for them to understand what, you know, what it takes to actually recycle. Well, the, you the know. Schools can utilize compost on site too. On site right? too. Yeah, absolutely. And, th and that's the thing, even looking at, you know, using our garden. So, you know, you could either have Lakeview, you could have um, Jersey, certain schools coming to the garden you know, planting different things. Um, actually, Mr. Cantu brought up an idea of maybe even having the kids come and plant pumpkins and then they can distribute, you know, but it makes them, you know, but there's so many different things that they can work with, you know, programs that Cal Recycle is actually doing. And it just makes it easier for all of us because the biggest thing is we have to make sure we are doing programming, some type of program. That's what keeps us in the clear and so far, the different programming, the, the stricter rules that we've had actually has helped us a, a great deal. The permitted, the permitted recyclers that you put in place mm -hmm. were a big assistance to the Cal Recycle because they look at that and said, these are large volumes coming out that are being processed that weren't being processed before. We're talking thousands and thousands of tons of material. So yeah, you're right. And then right now they're even looking at the scrap metals. Mm -hmm. Those individuals that pick that up well, they're trying to mandate them that they're not going to allow them to pick up the scrap metals. And people don't realize a lot of individuals are going to lose their jobs. So the, you know, the individuals that we see sometimes come through our alleyways, we may say, oh, why are they doing this? They're waking us up. They're making a mess. But in all reality, it's actually helping us out because they're taking the pure support, you know, metal products and they're taking it to where it has to go that it could be recycled. And, you know, when people don't understand, too, when it comes to organics or when it comes to food waste, if it, if, it, if it has a, you know, your paper plate or your plastic plate and you throw that, you think I'm going to dump that in my food waste, it, that's considered trash because it's yep. attached waste. to something else that is not part of the food waste. So there's a lot of education and programming that we can do and, you know, we can make it fun for our residents and our kids. Um, You're absolutely right. That is one of the big things, too. I have, a, I have a couple of questions. So it's the food is going to be going into the green. Correct. Okay. Yes. Now, like Dwayne just said, not the not like the plastic, only the actual food. So as residents, we would go remove our food from our plate, put in a separate, you know, whatever it is, and then put that in the green container. Yes. And everything else goes in the, you know, divide the other way. Correct. Now, when we're doing this and it starts going into process, I know Maribel handles a lot of it. So a city's uh, point of view or from our standpoint, do we hire another person? Because that's going to be so overwhelming for Maribel. Is there somebody that we like, is there funding for us to hire another employee or someone else? So that is actually one of the things in, in SB 30, 1383 yeah. that does yeah. say that. It does. And actually, there's a different bill that, I mean, that people don't realize 5% of what we make is supposed to be used. Well, now everybody knows, but it's supposed to be used for staff. No, as you said, so and I'm that's, asking. yeah, you're absolutely right, Juanita, that staff that Maribel's looking for, because some of the things we were asking for is, you know, not only that, we were looking for um, kind of like a, a police, police service, but to actually be in the trash with Maribel so they actually can go out. We were going to give them 20 hours a week, and this is when Don Pell was here. They, you know, it's like an intern, but they do 20 hours a week. Of course, they get paid, but they can go out and monitor who has the trash can. That's why we have a sticker seal that's going to be in place. If people don't have that seal, then we know they're illegally doing something wrong. And then, of course, you can fly drones or so many different things that they can do. But 
I know for Maribel, like you brought up, it's hard for her because seven times she goes out to these facilities and they're pretty scary to go out. And, you know, and I know Maribel's a real tough girl. I mean, you know, but that's the thing that you, we need the proper staffing. And we know that Mr. Howell, you know, as the consultants, that's, they do their part, but we are going to have to hire that's, individuals That's one of the things in 1383 that. is to increase staffing as needed to be able to cover organics. Now, and another thing I have, and I'm sorry, I have a couple questions regarding this. Um, since it has to be outside, you know, we have to advertise, we have to inform people. Could we, by any chance, get our social media involved? And maybe we can have contests, like we have the Red Ribbon Parade, just to get families involved. That way, the word gets out quicker. Absolutely. It's actually more free publicizing for us if we involve the schools and we can have contests on it. I mean, it's that something that yes. you would recommend yes. for us to do with the schools. Like, we have the Red Ribbon Parade, you know, make your own poster. We can do... Stuff like that, that all is part of the that's a, a very good way to do education absolutely and that's what cal recycle wants to see they yep. want to see those you hit it on the nose that's that exactly they what they exactly want to see want to see that type of stuff yep maybe we can do something like that you know it's i think it would help maribel too a lot because this is going to be over to me i mean you're very informed on all the trash stuff <laughs> with us you know maribel it's so overwhelming i think so much of this on her plate not that she can't handle it but i think we should be looking at someone else just specifically that work underneath Maribel, both of them together with our trash holders will make a bigger impact. Yeah, That's it does. Yes. And it is with this new regulations. It's, it's a dramatic increase in what had to be done previously. 1826 made stepped it up, which was the previous legislation that 1383 kind of overrides or, or adds on to. And then AB 939 was the one in 1989 that came in. It was the states, we're going to do this. Um, but it's this 1383 dramatically increased the monitoring, the reporting, the, all the things that goes along with it. Yeah, it dramatically increases if you're right. Council member, as um, stated earlier, yeah, we have been in communication with police services and having a part-time employee assisting with this as a uh, Council Member Samora was suggesting that we, we are looking into that. Um, Maribel has in, in a new position and she does now supervise the community engagement unit also. So social media is um, being supervised by her. So we're expecting all kinds of new um, endeavors being through, through that and we include, including this. I had a question. Um, I wanted to see, I noticed that it said penalties for violators. Yes. How, how are we going to monitor that? And what are the what are the violations? Well, that's also um, there's. I mean, what are the penalties? A couple so. different. Well, that's what we have to set. In the state legislation, it started at two hundred and fifty dollars. They don't state a absolute, but they give you a suggestion of what a fine could be. For a first fine, first time it's supposed to just be a citation. This is what the state says. Second time, uh, it's a it's a smaller fine, hundred. And the third time is $250 plus a mandate that you have to participate in the organics collection and at some point in the edible food recovery. So there will be fines for both. And not only that, you could even attach it to their conditional use permit. So if they're failing yes, there, you could. it actually, so it actually lets them know, you know, you're not going to get your permit back. That's um, correct. So when we did the permitted hauling, and we when we got rid of pretty much we didn't allow illegal hauling. Mm -hmm. So illegal hauling took away a lot of our money. Permitted hauling actually made us a lot more money. Uh, I think if as a city we probably made maybe I'm looking at Maribel uh, more than a million dollars if I'm correct. You know, so it brought in an extra million dollars for the city. You know, additional to what we were already making. So some of the things that we mandated was is repossession, like if it's their their truck if it's their um mm -hmm. their um box they, yeah, their you know, box yes their boxes um, re, re, um repossessing those and of course that kind of got even our haulers kind of like hey you know and it's like this is not against you guys this is to help you guys but that's the thing that's the fear that because everybody knows well maybe i'm not really doing this you know 100 percent well, this mandates this 1383 is kind of like letting everybody know there's no other choice now. But it also helps uh, from what I've experienced, and I and I joined also um, since we did that, they got rid of a lot of the rogue 
yeah. trash haulers yes. and the ones that are part of it actually got together yes and helped that's correct out. yes they became a band which helped us a lot and it helped it Maribel because then themselves were helping us out in all the road and, 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 and you're absolutely right Wani, because in the very beginning you saw the individualism that everybody was separated not realizing what the outcome was they didn't realize the permit you know so you have that but that's the part where you see the individualism because people want to you know play politics or they have to defend their business they don't realize we have to defend our city we have to do our part to make sure our city it's not their business that we're worried about we're worried about our city first because we're the ones who have to pay that fine so eventually they bonded together and realized this was a plus and it was going to help them and that's what exactly they i mean if we made an extra million that means they made you know it probably did. each company if yeah. you know and, they, and they probably also made three million you know we take 24 percent. so if they made four we made one you know so either way so there was a lot of things that played out in their favor of course they're not going to say thank you to us but they realize they're benefiting a great deal now and with the permitted recyclers what also is that that because those customers may have been in that person's area normally they're getting that tonnage as diversion on the EAR yep. when we submit the reports. So they're benefiting too because of that system. Yes, you're right. And the more diversion they do, of course, diversion is another form of saying recycling. The more diversion you see, the better off we are, we make more money. So when we have haulers who are not, you know, meeting their diversion rate, it hurts us as a city. And that's where we have to get strict because it's not fair if they're going to do it for other cities. Why aren't they going to do it for us? What's the difference between Santa Fe Springs and, a, and another city? They'll do it for them, but they won't do it for us. And that's just cheating us. So we have to make sure that we get strict with everybody all across the board. So. Met with all the trash haulers and everybody's on the same page too? Uh, yeah, I think they are. Oh, okay, yeah. good. They are. Um, they're cooperative. I, I talk to them uh, or try and get hold of them and, and have them stuff. And they're actually really good at getting me what I ask for. Yeah. So, and same with Maribel, you know, they contact Maribel fairly regularly too. Um, so they keep in contact and, and they work together pretty well now. And you don't see that in a lot of areas. You know, there's a lot of contention and a lot, but they, they work together very well. And Juanita, Maribel is the reason because of that. I mean, just to uh, let everybody know on staff, and I know that's why you brought up the help, which is awesome because she needs it. But if you guys understood with Maribel, when other staffers would get that booklet of trash, I mean, nobody wanted to touch it. Nobody wanted to deal with it. And Maribel, of course, I mean, she, she came on, excuse what I'm going to say, but, you know, she was green. She didn't understand anything about it. And then we started talking and, you know, we formed a, you know, we were able to, and that's the relationship of us, that if we have something we can help our staff or help anybody makes it easier. And Maribel, the fact that everything is just like, treat everybody the same. And you know what? Don't give anybody the upper hand because they're only going to look out for themselves, not look out for us. <laughs> Thank you, Steve, for shaking your head. But, yeah. you know, that, yeah, that's the biggest much. thing. And, you know, and that's why we have to make sure, like, we're unique because we have three haulers and that's what makes us real unique most cities have one and that's why we have to make sure they all play nice or they all start abiding by the rules and we have to you know so mm -hmm. hopefully you guys can do whatever you can and some jurisdictions stricter. have 13 and that's a, a nightmare in some yeah. cases you know and i think in our city when we first we had about 13 haulers mm -hmm. before yep. a while back and some of them bought each other out so you know, whatever we can do to assist you guys. I mean, so. Well, being able to come and present and, and talk about what's going to happen with 18, 1383 is a big step. And it's important that we, it's a process to go forward. Cal Recycle really does have a very good relationship with Santa Fe Springs and they're, they're here to assist. And that's specifically what they <coughs> said. They're here, they're, they're here to assist every jurisdiction, but because we communicate with them on a regular basis. A lot of people blow them off and you can't blow off yeah. Calversai, you can't blow off the state. 
and and just to let you guys know as a commercial city our diversion rate should be a lot higher because we have the 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 the, the material that we have it's easy you know to get it to get the diversion on it so we're not getting that proper diversion so a little city with a large industrial commercial is supposed to have a large you know diversion rate so certain certain entities certain haulers are not doing that and that's what we need to really crack down on so hopefully that's something you can do yeah. mr how yeah. greatly appreciate i know maribel's trying to do her part and she does it every day and she does an awesome does. stuff thank you any more questions Mr. Howard, I heard something we spoke earlier today that you can't use a plastic bag to put your your um, organic waste um, in that. You, so that could be a splatting onto your green waste. Are we expecting to have smells and problems with throwing it all in one can and that all mixing together? Is, is there going to be? It's mandatory that yeah, one of the mandates is that all solid waste or, or organics has to be collected at least once a week. Now, residential we know are already, but this also goes for commercial. Anytime there's a generation of organics, it's mandated to be at least once a week collection for organic material. You can use compostable quote unquote bags, but I can tell you from previous experience that compostable bags going to a high, uh, a big composting facility, yes, they do degrade. Doing it at home, nope. Compostable bag, it can't get hot enough. It has to be, there has to be heat in there to be able to break, break that down. So if there is a true compostable bag and if this material is going to a large composting facility, you can use a compostable bag in those. But yes, otherwise, no. So hopefully somebody will come out with some kind of spray. It's all out there, but you know what? Yeah, to spray they put the little head. green symbol on say it's compostable, but if you do the work on it and you break it down and you do it yourself, it ain't compostable. It doesn't. So, but that's also what the state of California and the organics committee is working on. They actually have uh, submitted information to the legislature saying that anybody who's using these symbols saying compostable and uh, Kobe Sky, who is the LA County Department of Public Works assistant director is on that committee. He actually leads it. And they're working on saying, if it doesn't, if it says this, it has to do this, or you're not doing you're not doing business in this state. So that's sitting out there and it will occur. They're not, they're going at it. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be different. It'll, it'll change. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It seems like we're a little bit behind, uh, not behind the ball, but I'm glad that we're going to be compliant really, really soon. Um, Maribel, we got to get her all the help that she needs. And I think it's going to consist of a lot of uh, education with our businesses, homes, and, uh, you know, just throughout, so we could, uh, but I appreciate you coming down here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howe. Okay. I think we are done with this study session. Uh, it is now, what, 5.55? We are adjourned. <coughs>